two quality stocks trading at fair value. This is a video that I started in January and you guys have enjoyed it very, very much. And you asked me to do it again and do it once a month. So I'm answering your call. And this is another one for February of 2024. And I'm going to likely be doing one every single month where I discuss two quality stocks trading at fair value. These are not cheap undervalued stocks and they are not overpriced either, but they are more of a safer investment, larger cap, mega cap stocks trading at fair value that can, you know, give low double digits to high double digits kind of, you know, returns 10, 12, 15% annual. And this is what I'm going to mainly be discussing. And I hope you continue watching these videos. I hope you continue supporting the channel by pressing the like button and give me your opinion about these stocks in the comments. If you like them, if you dislike them, or if you have any insights, or if maybe I missed something, you could let me know down in the comments. Now, one of the stocks I want to talk about, which is not for this video, this is two separate stocks, but I know a lot of you are going to ask me about this. And this is Clorox, which is Terry Smith. This is a pretty popular quality investor. He invests a lot of the quality stocks. He did buy Clorox. This is the only new buy he had. And for me, Clorox is still trading at the same price in 2018. It had a massive up, upward move in COVID. And then after the bleach stuff and COVID stuff went out. And I mean, it's just, it's not what it used to be anymore. And I don't really see a, any massive upside potential. I see a pretty safe 8 to 10% annual on Clorox. I don't believe it's extremely undervalued and I don't just don't really like it in general. So this is why I haven't talked about it. But the first stock that I'm going to talk about, which is more of a recession resistant stock with a moat, with pricing power. And I would argue as big of a moat as Pepsi and many of these consumer brands, yet you know, it's very hard to buy them below 20 times earnings, but this one is trading below 20 times earnings. And this is a company called Nestle or Nestle or however you actually pronounce it. I pronounce it Nestle. And this is a ticker symbol NSRGY. This is over a $220 billion market cap, but it's listed on the OTC. I believe the origin of the company is in Switzerland. This is where the corporate office is, but this is a global company. They also have listings in Europe. I think they also have a Canadian listing, but I mean, whenever I want to trade it or if I want to buy it, I would normally go for the OTC one, which is NSRGY. It's still trading at the same level it's trading at in 2019. It's extremely hard to find a quality company right now in this market over 5,000 on the S&P, you know, with this kind of chart. And this is a kind of opportunity I saw with LVMH in this video when I talked about it, then it bounced on earnings. And this is pretty much the same setup and earnings are coming up very, very soon. And I'm not sure if it's gonna beat or miss or if it's gonna crash more, or maybe it could do another LVMH and go up over 17 or 18% within two to three weeks. I mean, we might get luck on that. But this company, Nestle is an extremely popular company. And maybe you're not familiar with the name itself, but you're likely familiar with a lot of the brands they own. I mean, they own a lot of things, especially Nescafe. Nescafe is extremely popular, especially outside the United States. They own these pure life water. If you drink these pure life kind of purified water, they own this brand too. They own the Kit Kat brand outside the United States. And they own all kinds of things. They also own 30% of L'Oreal, which they own Ralph Lauren and Diesel and Giorgio Armani and all kind of, you know, pretty popular brands. So I'm sure you're familiar with some of the brands that they have. And most of them are essential necessity stuff you know, milk and, and the Nescafe stuff. People are addicted to that stuff. I mean, it's crazy. But a lot of them are necessity stuff with massive pricing power. And this is a global company, 35% in North America, 24% in Europe. They're everywhere, even in China. This is a pretty much a worldwide company with pretty good margins. Now, in terms of what they sell, 27% of revenues they come from beverages, including coffee, water, pretty essential stuff, massive pricing power. Now, what surprised me is that 19% comes from pet care. Now, this is something I didn't know about until I asked some friends and they do buy some kind of pet, you know, treats and pet, all kind of pet products that are made by a brand that's made by Nestle. And I didn't know that, but 19% of sales, they come from pet care. I mean, this is a pretty wide uh, moat, you could say, pricing power, essential stuff, recession resistant, you know, health and nutrition kind of bars and other things, you know, prepared dishes, milk product, and ice cream, water, 4%. I mean, this is essential stuff with some kind of pricing power. I'm going to show you what I mean here very, very soon. But this is a pretty good company that has outperformed 
performed as, as benchmark over the last 10 years, 154% return versus 107% return. For dividend investors, it has been paying dividends for over 28 years, and it has been increasing the dividend pretty much every single year since 1995. And I don't see a dividend cut anytime soon, and they tend to reward shareholders. Most of the free cash flow goes to dividend payments, but they also do some share repurchases and shares outstanding have been coming down, which is crucial at this level. Whenever these companies come down, you would really want them to be buying back stock to create shareholder value and higher EPS growth. And you had companies like Dollar General, that they were so leveraged up and such in a bad shape that they really couldn't do anything. But Nestle is not really in this position. Now, in terms of growth, this is where the market really dislikes Nestle. And it's one of the reasons why it is disliking Coca-Cola and even Pepsi. Pepsi and Coke have been doing very well, but Nestle has been doing very poorly uh, compared to them and, and the multiple is much, much cheaper. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but Nestle actually owns the rights of the Starbucks can of products that if you want to buy them and do them at home, Nestle bought the rights from Starbucks in 2018 for like three or four billion dollars. So all these kind of things you buy at home from Starbucks are actually from Nestle and Nestle does benefit from them. But in terms of North America, for an example, you know, real internal growth, which is volume, volume has declined by pricing 8.9%, which resulted in an 8% organic growth. I mean, this is the kind of thing these companies, especially Pepsi, Pepsi also faced some declining volumes in a lot of the chips and stuff, but such massive pricing power that they can make up for it. So organic growth was 8% for the United States, driven by pet care, which surprised me, Starbucks out of home products. It's the same thing in, in other countries. We could look at, for example, in Europe. In Europe, real internal growth, which is around volume, it declined 2.3%, but pricing was up 11.1%, which resulted in 8.8% organic growth. I mean, pretty amazing stuff. Also, pet care, coffee, and other things. Same thing in Asia. Internal growth was 0%, pricing 8.6%, organic growth 86 Latin America declined, they increased pricing 10.5%, which resulted in a 10% organic growth. This is the kind of mode this company has, the kind of pricing power, and this is very, very essential if you're looking for a higher quality company. Now, another reason why the market has been hating on it is because sales growth has been pretty much flat. And one of the biggest reasons for that was mainly foreign exchange. If you look at, you know, in terms of real growth, which is a volume, it has declined like 0.6%. But pricing was 8.4%. But you had foreign exchange fluctuations of negative 7.4%. This is huge on the Swiss franc because they measured icing on the Swiss franc. So euro on the Swiss franc, US dollar on the Swiss franc. And apparently currencies have been extremely volatile and they faced a 7.4% loss, which pretty much the real sales growth was negative 0.4%. I think in total or negative 0.1% or something like that. So this is one of the reasons why the market is freaking out. And this is something that I can't really understand. I mean, why negative 7.4% on foreign exchange? This is very, very high. Don't they hedge against these things? Don't they do something like that? I mean, this is out of the normal, but the business itself, I mean, they're still raising prices 8.4%. And I think the foreign exchange problem is more of a temporary problem than a permanent one. And currencies, I mean, have been stabilizing as of late. We did have some volatility, but I think they should be doing something about it. I mean, this is what I would guess. But looking at the business itself, they still have pricing power and they are still raising sales 8.4% in terms of pricing without really losing any huge, in term, anything major in terms of, uh, you know, volume and stuff. Now, in terms of EPS normalized, yes, it's been struggling a little bit lately, but EPS has increased over the last few years. In 2016, it was $3.40, 2023 is $5.76, and 2024 is expected to be $6.10. This is also due to buybacks, of course, whenever shares outside they come down, EPS goes up. So this is one of the reasons they've been buying back a lot of stock, especially lately. If you look at the free cash flow yield, the free cash flow yield is now 4.5%. But if you look on a historical basis, the market or the stock has pretty much bottomed where it is right now. So it has pretty much never went anything like really above 5%. And that was pretty close to 4.52%. So if you look at this line that I'm showing you, is that most of the time the stock has bottomed pretty close to the levels it is right now. Now, this is not a guarantee that it's bottoming out here, but at least we know that we're not paying an extremely expensive price because the highest it has traded at was a 5% free cash flow yield. The mean was 4.1%, and now it's trading at 4.5% free cash flow yield. So I wouldn't expect any major multiple expansion. It could happen, but I wouldn't bet on it. But I would say it's trading 
getting pretty close to a fair value of a four four and a half percent free cash flow yield and you also get the whatever the company has for 2025 and beyond they really have six to ten percent underlying eps growth this has been a historic growth before and then we have a little bit more inflation most of it is sticky i believe they're still gonna increase prices around seven or eight percent annual which should ultimately lead to eps growth of six to ten percent and you still have the four and a half percent free cash flow yield 15 percent return on invested capital the current return on invested capital is 12 percent and they expect it to you know get pretty close to 15 percent i wouldn't really count on it but in terms of a four and a half percent free cash flow yield six to ten percent eps growth and trading at the multiple where it's trading at which is not extremely expensive especially if you look at it on a pe basis if you look at the historical pe ratio it's now trading pretty close to 18 times earnings the company has traded at a mean of pretty close to 22 times earnings and as high as 27 times earnings and if we look here again this has marked a historical bottom for the company whenever it hit this PE, which is something I look at, and this is crucial. So it could be near some kind of a bottom with the stock, and I would expect whatever the company is guiding to be true, between 6 to 10% EPS, 4.5% free cash flow yield, any potential multiple expansion from 18 times to 21 or 22 times, once the FX headwinds and a lot of the volume stuff stabilizes and improves. So I see some upside with the stock. Again, it's not going to make you rich, or it's not going to you know, make you a millionaire or anything crazy, if you invest a little bit of money you could do that with growth stocks but this is a high quality company with pricing power recession proof recession resistant trading at fair value maybe a little bit more on the undervalued side with some bad sentiment with this kind of chart so i'm very really very interested in nestle i have it on my uh, watch list i'm watching it closely i might open a position i might not i tend to update these things to my group members if you're interested you could watch the video down in the description and see if this is something for yourself but this is the first stock that i have for this video and I have another one that I talked about a few times and it's still flat since I talked about it. I mean, this is pretty much the only stocks that haven't moved and I do own the second one. Most of the stocks I have have gone up. I have one or two that are flat to going down and this one has pretty much not moved and I have to talk about it. And this is a company called BJ's Wholesale Club and I compared it to Costco before. I showed you this chart, how it was outperforming Costco. Well, now the opposite has happened and Costco has outperformed BJ's Again, BJ's is up over 163% uh, over the last five years. Costco is now up 233% over the last five years. So I used to brag about BJ's being up more than Costco. I can't do it anymore because Costco has you know, crossed BJ's even though they were trading together for a while. Then BJ's outperformed Costco in 2022. The Costco crashed with the stock market and now the opposite has happened and Costco has outperformed BJ's. I expect the gap to eventually close between them maybe later on in the year or in 2025. But this is what I mainly want to talk about because this stock is very very weird i mean the s p 500 goes up everything goes up except the stock but sometimes on red days if you follow the stock and if you notice you have the s p going down and bj is going up and you're like what's going on why is this happening well i looked at the correlation between bj's wholesale club and the s p 500 this is a very deep negative correlation it mainly started in 2022 then it correlated positively with the s p 500 which i would expect but then we had a extremely deep neg like negative correlation so the s p 500 goes up this stock stays flat or go down and you could imagine what would happen to it if its s p is now sitting at 5000 so that's why it's been flat for so long and whenever the s p pulls back a little bit this stock has been rising but this is a very negative very deep uh, negative correlation between BJ's and the S&P 500. And the only explanation I have for that is in 2022, as I showed you in this chart, BJ's has outperformed Costco, has outperformed the S&P 500, and has outperformed a lot of stock. So what I would say is that maybe the algorithms are using and trading BJ's as some kind of an inverse stock to the S&P 500. I've noticed it with BTI, British American Tobacco. This is how it trades. Verizon also trades this way sometimes, where whenever they want to hedge or do something, they buy you know, British American Tobacco and the S&P is going down, British American Tobacco goes up. And the same thing I noticed with BJ's, even though BJ's should not be trading this way. I'm not saying this is an excuse because I'm going to talk about the fundamentals a little bit and give you my updated analysis. But 
But I do believe that this is one of the reasons why BJ's has been flat. I mean, it's not crashing, but it's not rallying. It's just flat. It's been flat since late 2021. And I don't think this is going to last forever. But this is one of the reasons. Now, BJ's Wholesale Club has pretty much the same business model as Costco. Almost the same thing. Within the warehouses, you have a membership. You pay an annual fee. And you get to buy things, bulk items at a discount. They have over 7 million members. I mean, this is not a small company by any means. Over 7 million members that they're paying every single year. In terms of retention rate, it has improved a lot. It used to be 81% in 97. And now in 2022, it's over 90% renewal rate or retention rate. And this is very important. And it shows you that whoever, whoever's buying at BJ's is having great experience and is building member kind of lifetime value with the company. And they're going to keep shopping at BJ's. It means BJ is doing something right. You could also look at the membership fee income. This is what MFI is, I believe. And membership fee income has been making new highs. I mean, since... And now the last fee increase, which was in 2017, it took off in 2018, and it has been making higher highs in terms of membership fee income. And this is very important with, you know, these companies like BJ's, 239 clubs, 169 gas stations in over 20 states. And they have expanded in a lot of new states, and have they had success, I believe in... I think they went in Indiana or in Ohio. It was some kind of a new one. And they did very, very well. And I mean, this is good feedback in general. So things are working out. They're doing the right things. They're reinvesting 100% of the free cash flow in building new stores, 8 to 10 stores every single year. They're not paying a dividend. And they're doing a little bit of buybacks, but nothing crazy. Most of it is reinvesting to grow EPS per share. And this is what matters with this company. And I've talked about it before, so I'm not really going to do a deep dive because I have so many. You could look up my name and check out this company. But they expect high single digit to low double digit EPS growth. And I would expect the same thing. So between, and I, would, I would say 10 to 12% EPS growth every single year. Now, if you compare the valuation of BJ's to Costco, I've done it before. And so far, I look wrong because Costco has continued to expand and BJ's has been pretty much the same. But if you look at this massive gap, Costco is trading at 45 times forward earnings. Now, BJ's is the same business model, pretty much. Yes, they're not in China. They don't have these values of people trying to go in them. I understand. But they're still in the United States. They're still growing EPS pretty much very close to what Costco is growing it at, sometimes higher. They have higher gross margins than Costco. Costco does have higher same store sales growth, which is key with these retail companies, but it's trading at 45 times earnings versus BJ's at 16 and a half. Now, I'm not saying Costco should be trading at 16 and a half. Costco is a much better company. It's an amazing high quality compounder and it's an amazing company in general. But I don't believe Costco should be trading at 44 times. And I don't believe BJ's, which is its younger version, it has much longer runways, it should be trading at only 16.8 times. And the market has made this mistake and has corrected this mistake before. This is why BJ's has traded around 20, 21 times earning for a while, which I believe is more of a fair multiple. But lately, it has been only trading at 16.8 times earnings. Costco has been trading at 44 times earnings. Now, in terms of BJ's, they had a very hard time in 2023 with comp sales comparing what they had in 2022. Because 2021 and 2022 were massive years for them. 2023 comparing against 2022 was very hard, and they just couldn't put up the numbers. So the stock has suffered. But as the CEO said, and this is what I believe, that 2024 is going to be much easier for them on comps on 2023 numbers. It's going to be much easier for them to beat analyst expectations because I believe analyst expectations are very, very low for this company in 2024. And the way the sentiment is, the way the stock is looking, I mean, I'm, I am extremely optimistic for 2024. And, and I, I like it in general. In terms of EPS, I would expect a 10 to 12%. This is the analyst estimates showcasing around 12% EPS growth. To give you a very basic calculation on something like BJ's, if they do hit 616 in 2028, which I believe is fair, this is around an 11% yearly EPS growth. I think it's, it's very possible. And they do trade at 20 times earnings, just where they were trading at a year and a half ago. This is $123 per share. The stock right now is trading at $68. So we divide it by 68. This is pretty close to an 81% on the upside over the next five years with something like BJ's. And it could be a little bit higher, it could be a little bit lower. But again, I'm not showing you a stock that's going to make you rich. I'm showing you a very safe investment with very long-term runway. This is a recession-proof company. People need to eat. You have war. Whatever you have, people need to eat. People need to buy groceries and people need the Nestle products. And it's the same thing with BJ's. I think Nestle has a higher 
a potential of compounding higher returns than BJ's. It's a more mature company with much more, you know, branding power and all these kind of things. But I think BJ's has much longer runways, and I don't know how far this expansion it could go. I know it's not going to remain at 16.8 times earnings forever. I think it's going to eventually near 20 times. It could go maybe to 22, 25 times, and I would be extremely surprised. But I mean, it's possible because compared to Costco, this thing is dirt cheap and it has so much potential and the company is working on themselves. They, for example, people just go there to buy water and groceries and they go home. But they don't really try to shop for clothing, shop for discretionary items. And this is what BJ's has been working on. I went to a lot of their stores and their stores look so much better. They're much more organized. You could see what they have. I see people now, they're looking at clothing, they're looking at discretionary items. This wasn't the case before. It was messed up. So they're working on a lot of these things, and I'm pretty optimistic. So I like BJ's at this price. I like Nestle at this price. And these were my two stocks for February of 2024. If you're interested in more stocks, especially smaller and micro cap stocks, which is my specialty, what I really like to invest in, they're too small to share them on YouTube. I share them in my own group if you're interested. So thank you for watching again. Not financial advice. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please press the like button and maybe consider subscribing. So I hope to see you in another video.